So this is the uh, second of our videos on tilings and the mathematics of tilings. And whereas I spoke about periodic tilings in the first video, now I want to move on to non-periodic tilings, and in particular a subset of non-periodic tilings called aperiodic tilings, the most famous of which are the Penrose tilings. Now this is going to get us into some really, really interesting stuff, very unexpected, and also a discovery that completely blew scientists away, the discovery of crystals called quasi-crystals, which display aperiodic tiling. So let's discover the mathematics of non-periodic tilings. There are infinitely many periodic tilings, and there are also infinitely many non-periodic tilings, ones that lack translational symmetry and therefore would fail the grid test that I mentioned in the first video. In the past, mathematicians thought that if you could make a non-periodic tiling from a set of tiles, then you could also make a periodic tiling from the same set. Isosceles triangles, for example, will tile periodically, but can also be arranged in a radial pattern, which though highly ordered, is clearly non-periodic. In 1961, Chinese logician and mathematician Hua Wang wondered whether it would always be possible to determine in advance, using a well-defined procedure or algorithm, if a set of tiles can tile the plane. He focused on sets of square tiles whose edges were coloured in various ways. These became known as Wang dominoes. He conjectured that it should be possible to make such a determination on the assumption that every set of tiles that can tile the plane can do it periodically. A couple of years later, however, one of his students, Robert Berger, showed that this assumption was flawed. Using Wang dominoes, Berger found the first example of an aperiodic tiling, one made from tiles that could be arranged to form a non-periodic tiling, but not a periodic one. It was a massively complex affair that involved more than 20,000 tiles. Later, Berger found a set of just 104 Wang dominoes that was aperiodic. Others, including computer scientist Donald Knuth, reduced the number still further. Many variations on the Wang dominoes are possible by adding projections and slots, but they're all approximately square in form. In 1977, amateur American mathematician Robert Amman found an aperiodic tiling that used just six square type tiles. Whether any further reduction is possible using tiles derived from the Wang Domino prototype isn't known, although it seems unlikely. Further progress was made, however, by shifting attention to other types of tile that might force aperiodicity. Leading the way in this research was the English mathematician and mathematical physicist Roger Penrose, best known for his work on the general theory of relativity and cosmology. In the early and mid-1970s, Penrose discovered three different types of aperiodic tiling, which are now named after him. The first, referred to as P1, is made from a pentagon and three other shapes, a diamond, a star and a boat. The diamond is a skinny rhombus, a quadrilateral with four equal sides and equal opposite interior angles. The star is a pentagram having five points, and the boat is a piece of the pentagram, roughly three-fifths of it. These shapes have to be put together according to certain rules and are normally shown in different colours. The other two tilings that Penrose found each used just two different tiles. P2, the best known, is made from a kite and a dart of very specific proportions. These two shapes can be obtained from a single rhombus whose long diagonal is divided in the ratio 1 to 1 over phi, where phi is the golden ratio. Alternatively, the kite can be thought of as two joined golden triangles, obtuse isosceles triangles in which the ratio of the length of the equal sides to the length of the third side is 1 over the golden ratio. The dart, on the other hand, is made from two golden gnomons, triangles whose three angles are in the proportion 1 to 1 to 3. 
the acute angle of the golden gnomon is 36 degrees, which is the same as the apex of the golden triangle. Without further embellishment, the kite and dart would be able to tile the plane periodically. To avoid this possibility, notches and tabs can be put on the ends of the tiles, or more aesthetically pleasing, coloured circular arcs can be added, with the rule that the tiles must be pieced together in a way that makes matching colours join. The third type of Penrose tiling, P3, is made of two different rhombi with acute angles of 36 and 72 degrees respectively. Again, these must be put together in specific ways to avoid periodicity. For instance, they're not allowed to be placed so as to form parallelogram. A common feature of all the Penrose tilings is local five-fold rotational symmetry. Penrose and independently John Conway prove that whenever the coloured arcs on the tiles close to form a circle, pentagonal symmetry would be displayed by the entire region around the curve. Although there's an uncountable infinity of Penrose tilings, all of them are alike. In other words, every part of any Penrose tiling is contained infinitely often in every other such tiling. It's impossible, therefore, to tell from any patch of a tiling to which tiling overall it belongs. To explain the weirdness of this, the mathematical writer Martin Gardner imagined what it would be like if you lived on an infinite plane tessellated by one of the uncountable infinity of Penrose tilings. You can imagine your pattern piece by piece in ever-expanding areas. No matter how much of it you explore, you can never determine which tiling you are on. It's no help to travel far out and examine disconnected regions because all the regions belong to one large finite region that is exactly duplicated infinitely many times on all patterns. English mathematician John Conway proved a remarkable theorem about matching regions of Penrose patterns. Suppose the diameter of a certain circular region of one tiling is D. Starting from a random point on another Penrose tiling, how far away will the nearest identical circular region be? Conway showed that the distance to the perimeter of the nearest matching region will never be more than D times half the cube of the golden ratio, or approximately 2.11 times D. The same is true of identical regions on the same tiling. The distance from perimeter to perimeter is never more than about double the diameter of the region. Aperiodic tilings as purely mathematical creations came as a surprise, but this was nothing compared to the shock that scientists got when they found them in the real world. It was pretty much taken for granted that all crystal forms in nature have rotational symmetry of order 2, 3, 4 or 6, and all show extreme regularity in the arrangement of their faces and cleavage planes. But in 1976, Roger Penrose hinted in a letter to Martin Gardner that quasi-periodic crystals might be a possibility. Gardner had recently notified Penrose about a new discovery made by Robert Amman, two rhombohedra that tiled space in an aperiodic way. Penrose pointed out that some viruses take on dodecahedral, that's 12-sided, and icosahedral, 20-sided, forms, and that it had always been a puzzle how they did this. He added, but with Amman's non-periodic solids as basic units, one would arrive at quasi-periodic crystals involving such seemingly impossible cleavage directions along dodecahedral or icosahedral planes, is it possible that the viruses might grow in some such way involving non-periodic basic units? Or is the idea too fanciful? Far from being fanciful, it proved to be extraordinarily prophetic. Over the next few years, speculation grew in the research community that crystalline structures based on aperiodic lattices could exist. Then in 1984 came a sensational announcement. Israeli material scientist Dan Schechtman and colleagues at the US National Bureau of Standards reported that they'd found an aperiodic structure in electron micrographs of a rapidly cooled aluminium manganese alloy. 
the micrographs of what some chemists quickly dubbed Schechtmanite showed a clear fivefold symmetry, strongly suggestive of an aperiodic space tiling akin to Penrose tiling. For his discovery of what became known as quasi crystals, Schechtman was awarded the 2011 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Today, hundreds of quasi crystals with different compositions and symmetries have been identified based on a variety of metal alloys. The first to be produced were thermodynamically unstable and would revert to an ordinary crystalline form upon being heated. But the first stable ones were discovered in 1987, enabling samples to be produced in large enough quantities for detailed studies that may one day lead to technological applications. After a long hunt for naturally occurring quasicrystals, an international team of scientists finally identified one in the form of a substance given the name icosahedrite, having the chemical formula Al63, Cu24, Fe13, it was found as tiny grains in a sample collected from an outcrop of the mineral serpentine collected from the Koryak mountains in Russia. Analysis showed that it almost certainly came from space aboard a type of meteorite called a carbonaceous chondrite around 4.5 billion years ago, not long after the Earth formed. A geological expedition to the place where it was found identified more specimens of the meteorite confirming its extraterrestrial origin. The same type of aluminium, copper, iron, quasicrystals had previously been made in the lab by Japanese metallurgists in the late 1980s. There are still many unsolved problems connected with tilings, both in maths and in nature. In the case of Penrose tilings, the smallest number of different tiles needed is currently two. Can it be reduced to one? No one has any idea, and it remains a fascinating open question. Another outstanding problem was posed by German geometer Heinrich Hiesch in 1968. The so-called Heesch number of a shape is defined as the maximum number of times that a shape can be surrounded by copies of itself with no gaps or overlaps. Obviously in the case of a triangle, a quadrilateral, a regular hexagon, or any other single shape that can completely tile the plane, the answer is infinity. Heesch's problem was to determine the set of finite numbers that can be Heesch numbers, including the largest possible finite Heesch number. In thinking about this problem, it's helpful to define the Heesch number more precisely. In a tiling, the first corona of a tile is the set of all tiles that have a common boundary point with the tile, including the original tile itself. The second corona is the set of tiles that share a point with anything in the first corona, and so on. The Heesch number of a shape is the maximum value of K for which all tiles in the kth corona of any tiling are congruent to that shape, for a long time, the record holder for the largest finite value of k was 3 in the case of a shape found by Robert Amann, which consisted of a regular hexagon with small projections on two sides and matching indentations on three sides. However, in 2004, Casey Mann, a mathematician at the University of Washington, showed that there was an infinitely large family of tiles consisting of indented and outdented forms of a pentahex a group of five hexagons, for which the Heesch number is five. This remains the largest finite value known, though it seems likely it will be surpassed in the future. The Heesch number question seems closely connected to two other famous open tiling problems. Does there exist an algorithm for determining whether a shape can tile, and does there exist a shape that can only tile aperiodically? Aperiodic tiling seems to act as a barrier to the existence of tiling algorithms, so it isn't expected that both of these problems have the same answer. On the other hand, if no finite Heesch number is larger than some k, then it seems that this could be used as the basis of an algorithm to test whether a shape tiles. Simply attempt to fill out a tiling to the k plus oneth corona. If successful, the shape must tile the plane, and if not, the shape doesn't tile. 
I hope you've enjoyed this peek into the history, science and mathematics of tilings. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again very soon to discover more maths.